Hey, what's up? This is Steve from Snow Foundry. This is part three of our installing Gen 2 series, which is installing the Sage 3 Tarball. If you haven't seen parts one and two, in part one I walk you through creating a live USB key, setting it up in the network. In part two I cover partitioning and file systems, which gives us somewhere to install Gen 2 2. In part three we're going to mount those file systems, and we're going to install the Stage 3 Tarball on those file systems. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first step is going to be to mount the partitions. In the last video, we made partitions, which divided the disk into four sections, and then we put file systems on those partitions so that we know how to read and write to it in an organized manner. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to mount those partitions, which means give it a path name. So if you're familiar with Windows, you have the C drive. Uh, in the same way, when we mount something somewhere, we're just giving it a name like C, although with Unix-type systems, uh, the names are much more explicit, well-defined, and they're not just an arbitrary A through Z. You can name them whatever you want. So for instance, if I had a drive where I just wanted to store videos, I could mount it to slash mount slash video. And when I say slash mount, it's abbreviated to slash MNT, uh, but it's very arbitrary. So you could even have each user mount those drives in their own home directory. So for instance, I could have an external drive and just mount it to uh, home charms slash videos and store all my videos on that drive. And so there's a lot of different ways to configure it. It's very uh, flexible and it gives you a more descriptive way than you might have been used to in the past. So we're going to go ahead and type fdisk-l, which is going to show all of our partitions. Uh, you see here I have a dev slash sde. That's just my live USB key. And we have a dev slash sdd, which is the actual external USB hard drive I'm installing to. It has four partitions on it. So uh, partition one is just that reserved BIOS area. We don't need to do too much with that. Uh, it's there for best practice and enables the highest number of configurations, but uh, it won't really impact us or we don't have to directly interact with it for the sake of this video. Uh, slash dev slash sdd2 is our boot directory. So that's where all of our boot up configuration is going to go. And we can do things like enable it to dual boot. So if we wanted a dual boot configuration with Linux and Windows, we would update our slash boot configuration to include a Windows option there. We have a swap partition on slash dev slash sdd3. And swap is what happens when we run out of memory. So if you run out of RAM, rather than just stopping your programs, what Linux will do is it will uh, extend your RAM onto the hard drive using that. It's not so typical anymore. It was more so in the past, uh, but it's still useful to have and it's a best practice. On slash dev slash sdd4 is where all of our data is going to go. So when we install Gen 2 and all the programs that come with it, everything will be on slash dev slash sdd4. There are a lot of different ways you can partition and lay out things, and it's recommended on servers, for instance, that you'd have a separate slash var directory. Uh, the reason for that would be is because in Linux, there's log files, and as we all know, log files continuously grow and grow and grow. And so you'd want to have its own separate space uh, so that if it runs out of space, it doesn't impact the rest of the system or vice versa. If the rest of the system runs out of space, you still want to log. And so there's a lot of different advanced options here, and I recommend you check out the handbook to figure out what's right for you. For our sake, we're going to have everything on one big slash dev slash sdd4, uh, which we're going to mount to slash mount, and that will have all the logs, all the system files, our home directories, etc., on one partition. Up until now, we've been referencing the disk by slash dev slash sdd, but there's a few risks associated with that. Uh, slash dev slash sdd is dependent on where we plugged in the disk. So in this case, I'm using an external USB SSD, and if I unplug it and replug it in at different times, and even during this video you'll see, sometimes it's slash dev slash sdd, sometimes it's slash dev slash sde. Uh, what we want to do is find a, th a UUID, which we can reference it by. Uh, a UUID is a universally unique identifier, and it's generated for each disk, and it never changes. So we can reliably refer to this UUID uh, instead of that, so that if I replug it in and it comes up as slash dev slash sde or slash dev slash sdf, it won't matter because I'm actually going to refer to the path which is called the UUID. If we explore the slash dev file system, we'll see that there's a bunch of things called symbolic links. And symbolic links are the equivalent of a Windows shortcut, which just means here's a path name, but it really points to this other path. 
Uh, so you'll see that I can find both the UUIDs under my dev file system, and I can also find a by ID, which kind of describes the disk and makes a string out of it. So in this case, I can see USB dash SanDisk, external SSD, and then a serial number, which actually points to slash dev slash SDD. So in Linux, everything is a file or a link to a file. And in this case, uh, we have a bunch of different names we can refer to our disk. Uh, I would recommend using the UUID, and we'll do that when we get to the uh, configuration section later in the video about configuring a file called FSTab. FSTab is going to tell our system how to actually mount the file systems each reboot so that we don't do it by hand. And there we're going to use the UUIDs. In this case for now, we can just use whatever path we want. You can mount it by slash dev slash SDD or the using the by ID like I'm doing here. And that will mount it just as well uh, because they're all pointing to the same thing. Okay, so that was a whole bunch of talking for what boils down to basically two commands. We're going to mount our root file system under slash mount slash gen2, and we're going to mount our boot file system under slash mount slash gen2 slash boot. We'll need to do the root file system portion first so that we can make a slash boot directory and mount it there. Uh, the reason is, is because in order for all these things to be accessible, they need to be somewhere under your root file system tree. So in this case, we're going to make a boot directory, and we're going to mount slash dev slash sdd2 to the slash boot directory, or you can mount it by UUID or by the device ID. Uh, any of those work and they all accomplish the exact same thing since they're symbolically linked to slash dev slash SDD2. You may be wondering why I had to make the slash boot directory and why it didn't already exist. When we made the file systems, it made completely empty file systems. There's nothing on there. So when we mount our root partition, it's totally empty. If we make the slash boot directory, that gives us a spot to mount our slash dev slash SDD2 to. And then in our stage three tarball extraction, what's going to happen is, is it's going to make all the directories we've come to expect. So for example, our configuration files are normally under slash etc or etsy. Uh, it's, not, it's not there yet. And so when we do the stage three tarball extraction, it will make all the typical file system directories that you've come to expect on a Linux system, but they don't exist yet at this point in the process. If we type the mount command, we're going to see a list of file systems that are mounted on the system. You'll notice that even though I mounted the disk by ID, it shows up as slash dev slash sdd2 and slash dev slash sdd4. The reason is, is because those are just symbolically linked names, and like I said, they're literally equivalent. And so Linux gives us the flexibility to call things by very verbose descriptive names, but they still accomplish the same things. There's no additional overhead or complexity that goes along with that. It's still the same devices. It's just an easier and more predictable way to do it. So let's go ahead and flip back to the handbook. And we're going to see that before we download a stage tarball, we're going to need to make sure we have accurate time. The reason is, is that when we connect to download the stage tarball, if you do it over SSL, it has to validate the certificates. They may show up as invalid if your clock is off. The other reason is, is because the tarball itself will have a bunch of timestamps for everything that it extracts. If those timestamps are in the future, a lot of tools are going to think that it's invalid because they're used to dealing with time which has already happened rather than time in the future. So to be safe, what we're going to do is we're going to use NTP and we're going to sync against a time server and that's going to update our time to the correct value. You can also check out your time by just typing the date command and that's going to show you what it's currently set to. So once your time is all set up and that it's synchronized to a time server, we can go ahead and download the stage tarball. We're going to go ahead and flip back to the handbook, and it's going to describe how to download the tarball. And it's also going to mention that there's both a multi-lib and a not multi-lib. We're going to choose the multi-lib because that enables us to install things like Steam, which ship with 32-bit binaries in addition to 64-bit binaries. So despite having an entire page on this, the entire process is actually really simple. We're going to CD to the Mount Gen 2 directory. We're going to use Lynx, which is a command line web browser, to go to the Gen 2 mirror site and pick a mirror that's close to us. And then we're going to navigate to the releases AMD64 auto builds directory. From there, there's a bunch of stage three tarballs, and we're going to pick one that looks like it fits our use case. We're going to download it and then verify that it was actually not corrupt or that not tampered with. And uh, then we're going to extract it. So let's go ahead and do that. Switch back to the console and type links HTTPS colon slash slash www.gen2.org slash download slash mirrors. This is going to bring us to the Gen2 mirrors web page where we're going to select a mirror that's closest to us. There's not really a science to it, since being close to you doesn't mean it's internet close to you, uh, but it's a good bet that if you pick something in your local region that you will get a good response time and a higher download rate than something on the other side of the world. So select a mirror and then hit enter, and that will go ahead and open the link. 
We're going to see a few directories here. Uh, you can ignore most of them. And if you happen to visit one and you want to go backwards, in Lynx, the key to go backward is Z. So just hit Z, and that will take you right back to the directory uh, that you were previously, and then you can go to the correct directory. So in this case, we're going to go to Releases, and we're going to select AMD64, and there's going to be a number of different uh, releases, both official and time-stamped. So we just want to pick the newest release here, and we're going to pick Auto Builds, which just means that uh, Gen 2 automatically builds when people commit, and we want to get the newest source code. And so by picking Auto Builds, we'll always have the most recent one. And so at the time this video was recorded, these were like 24 hours old, and uh, we could just pick something that was basically just built automatically, but that passed all their tests and everything prior to being published. Uh, so we're going to scroll down here. There's a ton of options. I'm just going to pick the Stage 3 AMD64 and download that one. There's a couple other ones like Minimal, Cloud, Hardened, etc. Um, so you can pick those options. You can look in the handbook and kind of choose which ones you want. Uh, in most cases, the Stage 3 AMD64 will be the easiest and include the most uh, typical use cases. Uh, so we'll just select that. So we're going to let this download for a second, and then we're going to come back and extract it. I went ahead and sped up the download, and so now we see that there's a few more files here. There's a contents, a digest, and a digest at ASC. If we flip back to the handbook and scroll down a little bit, what we're going to see is, is that these files are used to verify the integrity of the download. So what you want to try and verify is, is uh, because we downloaded this from a mirror, can we trust it? And the answer is, is that we probably shouldn't just trust the mirror blindly, and we should check the integrity of the download and make sure that we're getting the actual Gen 2 files that we expect we are. So we're going to go ahead and run a few commands here using OpenSSL uh, that will tell us that the tarball is indeed correct. Next, what we're going to do is switch back to Lynx, and we're going to download the ASC file. If you hit Enter on it, it's going to display it just like a text viewer would. So just go ahead and hit the Z key, which will bring you back to the listing again. And now we're going to hit the D key, which is going to mean download rather than view it. Uh, in this case, you'll notice that it has an extension of .tar, which doesn't make any sense and doesn't match the file name. Uh, delete that and type .digest at the end. I'm not sure if it's just a bug or what happened there, uh, but if you type .digest, it will go ahead and download the file, and then we can run these OpenSSL commands. The set of OpenSSL commands we're going to cover just verify the file integrity to make sure that's not corrupt. There are multiple other commands listed there uh, that you may want to do if you're suspicious of the mirror, if you are worried about traffic being modified in flight to your house. Uh, but in order to verify the file's integrity, what we can do is, is we can generate a SHA-512 sum, and then we can take that .digest file, and that's going to have the SHA-512 that it's supposed to be. And if those two match up, we know that we downloaded a, a bit-for-bit -bit identical copy of the mirror file, and so we're good to go ahead and start extracting it. Now we're ready to extract the tarball, which will give us a basic file system with all the tools needed to actually install Gen 2. The command itself is just tar xvjpf, which tells it, hey, here's a tar, extract it, and it's BZ2 compressed, so decompress it while you do that. And then at the end of it, we add a dash dash XATTRS. Uh, you need that XATTRS because this tarball has a bunch of system permissions set for it. So if you extracted it without that, your files wouldn't be set right for the system to operate, and that's very important. And so we're going to go ahead and type that in the console, and then we're going to get a huge wall of text, which is just going to be the entire file system being installed. And from there, we'll take it in the next video where we go and configure it, and we're going to actually be able to reboot into our new file system and uh, start configuring it for usage. And please be sure to subscribe and hit the like button so you get notified of when the next video comes out, and we'll cover all those details shortly. See you soon. 